opportunity to support mission work here at Axis right here in our local community through the work of Axis Community Care. That's right Isaac, since 2018 Axis Community Care has been taking the good news of Jesus outside the walls of our church, out into the wider community, being the hands and feet of Jesus in practical ways. We look forward to continuing to extend our reach out in the community this year as we engage in the Christmas tree appeal you might remember from last year. You'll be seeing this set up in the church foyer area over the course of the month and we really welcome your generosity towards that as we attempt um, to look out for those who might be otherwise going without Christmas this year. Your donations towards mission here at Axis continue to help us be a church going beyond itself, spreading the love of Jesus into North Lakes and surround us. We establish ourselves as a neighbourhood church here in this suburb, right here where God's placed us. Absolutely. And to do this, there'll be envelopes available here at the church whereby you can support this over the course of this month. And the last weekend of the month, a special offering will be taken up in support for the mission here at Axis. Or you can also go on the website and give at any time as well. Just look out for the mission page. Thank you everyone so much for your support. Stay salty, Axis Church. Good morning and welcome to church. Great to see you all this morning. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well and hope you're blessed by this time together. It's good to be together. It's good to remember God. It's good to remember all that he has done for us. And uh, I just want to commend you for the mission offering last weekend. So we're just introducing that um, cause this month. And then at the end of the month, we'll take up another mission offering. So we had an amazing start last weekend to this new way of doing mission giving. So really appreciate you getting on board with that. Uh, exceeded all expectations last weekend with the way you generously supported Wesleyan World Missions. This month, Access Community Care. So you might have noticed on your way in the Christmas giving tree in the foyer. So an opportunity for generosity in that way. There'll be the new, new sorry, not newcomers, wrong thing, morning tea at Bounty Boulevard. I think, yeah, on the screen you'll be seeing that now. Uh, 22nd of November for that. So some of the ways that we bless our local community uh, through our local mission outreach here, which is wonderful. So thank you for, for your support for that. Uh, if you're new to Access, we'd love to welcome you on November 21st, which is a Sunday. So following on from church, we'll have newcomers brunch. We uh, give you some food, um, hear a bit about your story and tell you a little bit about our church here. So we'd love to welcome you to that event if, uh, if you're new or exploring access. Another thing coming up soon is the church picnic on December the 5th. Unfortunately, had to cancel our last one due to restrictions, so we're hoping this one can go ahead without any dramas. So the plan is to be at Scarborough. Uh, I, I remember being new to Brisbane uh, early last year. I said Scarborough, and everybody laughed at the way I said it, so hopefully I've got that right this time, but we're looking forward to to that on December the 5th of gathering as a church family after church and just having some time of connection together. If Axis is your home, we welcome your generosity. There's several ways you can give. There's these black boxes around the building. If you'd like to donate financially, there's, you can do it through the cafe or the website, giving electronically as well. We appreciate your ongoing support and generosity to us here. Let me read to you from the book of Psalms this morning as we prepare to stand and sing worship to the Lord. It says this in Psalm 96, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And so, Lord, we turn our attention to you again this morning. We thank you that you are most worthy of our praise, of our honour, of our attention. And so in these moments we share together, please get it. Please may we bring our whole selves to you today. And may your Holy Spirit be present as we worship together. We invite that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join in as we sing. Good morning, Axis. It's an 
oldie but a goodie. Here we go. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hero of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Blessed assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, hero of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. I encourage you to shake your hands, shake your arms. Just don't hit anyone next to you. Shake your hips. Because this is reggae. You're going to bop. Hey, why don't you take a moment and say hi to someone you haven't seen before or met? Savior, all the day long. This is 
the world But it couldn't feel me A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough But you came along You put me back together Now every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's no sing it up
Father God, we thank you that you are our God, that you created us, that you've created this beautiful world that we live in. There is indeed none like you, and we thank you that you are reliable, that we know that you will always be with us, even when times are tough, you walk through us, with us through them. So Father, as we learn more about you today and uh, more about how to live your way in your world, we just ask that you would open our eyes, ears, mouths, everything else, Father God that we may have the best that you have to teach us today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
lift our voices. God, it is our joy today to say that you are good. You're not just good, you're so, so, so good. Lord, the world around us isn't. Sometimes the trials aren't. But you are good. Steady our hearts, Lord. Holy Spirit, come in these moments and remind us and give us discernment to actually separate circumstances with the intentions of God in those circumstances. And help us understand afresh you have no other intention than to bring good. Thank you, Lord, for the type of dad you are. So tender, so kind, so attentive, so present. We love you, Lord. We want to love you even more. Please take us all further today. The next step, whatever it looks like, Lord, take us there today. We pray it all for Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. Hey, kids, it's time for you to escape and head out to kids' ministry. You have a wonderful time there. The Lord bless you. Do you appreciate the music team this morning? It's so cool as I arrive early to church and see all the cars here. And I just think about their investment into you. And I really appreciate them. Their time and their practice and, and all of their energy. May the Lord bless them. So we're going to head into a time of communion just briefly before... You are blessed with a guest speaker today, but let me remind you um, 
of what Jesus has done for us as we take again the bread and the cup in memory of him. I recall a young man in my previous church context and he was, I think, hardly even 18 at the time and he got diagnosed with cancer and we were still a very small church at the time or church plant when I started and so I said to this guy, it was sort of when you're you're small you can pray for these things very personally because everybody knows each other's business. So I said to this young man, would you be okay if I brought you up the front and prayed for you on Sunday? And he, I guess he'd seen a few people be prayed for before. He was new to church. None of his family had faith. He was working it all out. He said, I don't mind you praying for me as long as you don't touch me. Okay. No worries. Of course, I honoured his wish, but I tucked that comment away. Sometime later, uh, he was engaged and I was working with he and his fiance by this stage preparing to officiate their wedding and um, I returned to that comment and I said I remember some time ago now um, I was pray- wanting to pray for you and you said as long as I don't touch you what was underneath that comment he went on to tell me about his dad and the abuse that was there and He said, every time a man has ever touched me, it's only been to harm me. And during that meeting, I had the privilege, and I warned him that I was going to do it. But I said, soon I'm going to come around the other side of this table. I'm going to hug you with all of my might. Because I want you to know that sometimes physical touch can be for the purpose of blessing, not harm. One of the challenges of this season we're in is the removal of that physical touch as we come together as a body of Christ and I'm never quite sure how to act when I meet someone new at the moment it's like we're not really supposed to touch you and we want to follow regulations and it's it's all a bit weird isn't it and awkward but one of the beauties of the body of Christ is what I would call non-sexual affection that can go on in the body the love the affection, the warmth that can be shown between brothers and sisters in the Lord with no dark intent just because we share in the same family together. One of the stunning things about Jesus is willingness to touch people. People that society saw as untouchable, lepers and the like. Jesus went there. He didn't just minister to people spiritually. He physically Loved people, touched them. One such example comes to us in Mark 5, a woman who had a constant bleed for 12 years. She suffered at the hands of many physicians, the scriptures tell us. She'd forked out everything she had to try and find healing. And her condition only got worse. She heard about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and thought, if I can just touch him all be made well and she plucked up the courage to do that she works her way through this massive crowd and she touches him Jesus it says immediately new power had gone out from him and he spins around who touched me and his disciples go take your pick there's thousands here you know someone in that thousand if you're looking that direction or perhaps somewhere in that thousand if you're looking in that direction we don't know Jesus persists and this woman feels vulnerable and exposed. Eventually she comes and trembles before him, it says. That was me. I touched you. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And the question I have when I read that passage that's troubled me for many, many years is, why not let this poor lady go hasn't she been poked and prodded enough over the last 12 years why Jesus why why expose her why bring her up in front of everybody I mean this is a private issue that she's been dealing with long enough just let her go on a merry way 
I don't think Jesus dishonoured her. I think he called her out for two reasons. Because he wanted her to know the living God saw her. She mattered enough. Stop and acknowledge. Jesus was on his way to an important appointment. Jairus, religious leader. Jesus was on his way somewhere. He, he was on important business. But he stops for her. She was seen. And he also wanted to know the source of a healing. This wasn't just some accidental fluke that suddenly these medications over the last 12 years have all of a sudden kicked in. Today is the day and you've been made well. What a fluke. It just happened to be the same day that you met Jesus. No, no, no. This was no fluke. This wasn't to be rationalised over time. The only reason this woman had been made whole was because she touched Jesus. So we come to communion, we remember the willingness of Jesus to come to us, touch the likes of you and me. And what can we say other than thank you? And so Lord, we bring our lives afresh to you. Touch us, heal us, make us new. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and the cup. And when he given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Preserve your soul and body to everlasting life. Let's take and eat, remembering Christ. Jesus took the cup and he said, drink from it, all of you. You're all invited into this new covenant. This blood was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So this blood, preserve your soul and body to everlasting life. Let's drink in remembrance of Christ. Lord, help us be a people that live in remembrance of you, that live changed, that live empowered by your spirit. Because at the cross, everything changes. It's your way of saying the connection can be restored between us and God. Heaven touches earth. And forever we are changed. And Lord, we say thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're in for a treat this morning as we have a guest speaker. So Lex has been here with us the entire weekend. And um, for the Relationship Blueprint series, and many of you were at that, and he stayed on and shared with us last night at church and sharing with us again today. So Lex is our Assistant National Director of the Wesleyan Church. And so if you don't know lots about the denomination, ask him afterwards. And he'll be able to tell you all about it. But you're going to be blessed. He has such a passion for God and his words. So why don't you welcome him as he comes to share with us today. Well, it's, um, it's really great to be with you. Um, I've had such a great weekend already. Uh, and uh, also, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated the worship this morning. I mean, I love the songs. I love the, the you know, the... 
uh, the big sounding songs, but today I just felt that gentle whisper. So thank you. Touched my heart. And I, I was led into worship. And that's a good thing. You know, um, we've been in a series, like in the Relationship Blueprint, and, and I just want to kind of start with a bit of a plug. Um, this Relationship Blueprint uh, put on by your men's ministry for everybody about how to do relationships better. Now, it probably doesn't sound like, you know, <clears throat> it's like a, the title, you're thinking, no, I know, I'm fine, I, I won't have to go and do that. But I have to be honest to say, I came in, yes, I, I was one of the speakers, but I received so much good stuff. A good practical stuff. And here's the thing. This is by your teachers, your, your own people here. <clears throat> your, and such great material. Very practical, very uh, accessible. And uh, I encourage you, I'm 100% sure that next year this will be put on again. You better not miss out. It's fantastic. And so just a bit of a, a plug, but it's, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a selfish one because in a sense I received so much and I don't want to keep it to myself. <clears throat> I had the opportunity of speaking on Friday night and then on Saturday night and again today. And I was, as I was speaking to the pastor, I said, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to preach a mini-series. And I'd like to pre preach a mini-series and the mini-series will be about relationships. And, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with the tongue and then I'd like to move to the ears and then I'd looked, like to move to the eyes. And that will be my mini-series, right? So on Friday night, I talked about the tongue. I talked about how important the tongue was to the things that you did. In fact, if you think about it, James tells us that the tongue has this ability to set the whole forest on fire, right? You know, it can set, it can set things destructive, right? In fact, the scriptures tell us, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, nothing that will bring destruction to others. Instead, let wholesome and good things come out that will actually bring grace to others. That's the tongue, right? And if you think about any of your relationships, I just about guarantee you, one or two of you had some problems with the things you said, right? You said something and then you went, ah, how do I back out of that? I'm in trouble, right? You, who's ever been, no, don't put your hand up, right? <laughs> who's ever been in trouble from what you said, right? Because the tongue, it's got this, James tells it, he, he hasn't a very good view of the tongue. He says, it's like this dangerous thing. It's got no control. It says stuff and it's not very controlled, right? But what we learned about the tongue was this. The tongue can either bring destruction or life. It can either bring, uh, it, it can kill or it can enliven. It, it can destroy or it can build up. And we learned that, the, that what the tongue can do is actually put your, the trajectory of your life. Think about it. You could say something and someone's life would be on a particular tra trajectory because of what you said. You know, in, in fact, it could be damaging. It can totally destroy them. In, in, in the end, that's their whole life is these words that they receive. Some of you, that's you today. Others, we know that what happens is someone gave you a word, and that word said some life into you, and that life built you up, and your trajectory of your life is now because of those words. So we learned that those words are important, and what we learned was that sometimes in the holiness denomination, we have a very bad idea about things that we do. For example, we say, well, you know those words, you said a bad word, you're in trouble, God's going to get you for that. When I think that's entirely missing the point. So what we do as a, as a holiness nomination is correct the outside, right? Make sure you don't say those words. So you, you try really hard not to say the words, but those words aren't the issue. What's the issue is where they come from. And where they come from is inside here. The scriptures tell us Jesus said this. It's not what goes into your mouth that makes it unclean. It's what comes out. And he said, what comes out is from the treasures you have inside of you. Right? And, and you might think treasures, well, of course, that's the really nice things. You have a little bit of money, a little bit of gold, something like that. You have them inside of you. But actually, we treasure more than that. We sometimes treasure rubbish. I'll give you an example. Do you remember that time you were hurt? Really hurt you? You took that thing, you opened up your little treasure box, you popped it in there, and you put it in your pocket. And you went, I remember that. And every now and then when it gets hard for you, you go down into your room when no one else is looking and you pull out that little box and you go, see, there it is there. And your life is run by this treasure out of the treasures in the heart. So how do you fix this problem of the tongue? You fix it by what's in here, right? And the scriptures tells us, let the stuff that goes in make a difference. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it let it help you. Let it be that, that. I love that word dwell. It's hang around. Let it hang around in you, right? Let it change you. Romans tells us this. That's what we talked about Friday night. On Saturday night, we'll say, well, you know what? There's a problem with this because the tongues is only one part of your life. 
There's also your ears. And my dad used to say, you have one tongue, you know, one mouth and two ears, and you should use them in that proportion. You should listen twice as much as you speak. In fact, James tells us this. He says, the problem is, right, you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. But here's who we are. I'm sorry to say it, and it's probably not you, but it's the person next to you. We are quick to get angry. We're quick to get angry. We are quick to speak, and we are slow to listen. Because James is trying to tell us, you guys, you got it the wrong way. The tongue can cause enormous damage, but the ears, they can protect you from the tongue. You know, you, you, your ears. And, and here's the problem. We should go through our whole life and we should say, you know what, people in this church and people in my relationships, they should fix their tongue because the things they say, they hurt me. You know, you sit there and you go, I'm going to wait. Come on, change. The things you say, they hurt me. Stop it. But here's the thing about life. You can't be responsible for someone else. They get, you know what's going to happen is they're going to say stuff. Sometimes it's going to hurt you. Sometimes it wasn't even meant to hurt you, but it hurt you, right? And you just, you received it in your spirit and you look, you took it on board. And, and this is what I'm talking about here. What the, what the ears are is about, it's your ability to control what comes in. And I know this is hard, but you can actually stop it. Because if you hear it, what do we do? We take offense, right? Oh my gosh, can you believe what they said to me? And then we take it to heart and then we put it in our little box and then we keep it. But what, what the scripture tells us is it's possible to be wise. And what a wise person says, here's something. And here's the hard thing about wise people. If you ever met a wise, per wise person, when they get in trouble, tells them off, guess what? They get wiser. How is this, right? And me, I feel like I'm the other guy. You know, I get told, I get into trouble, I get, and, I, and I react and I become a fool. And here's what the scripture tells us. Is it tells us you can be wise, but the way you're wise is you, you filter what you, you receive, right? And you, you, some things, you know, what happens is there's often truth in everything you hear. And you could probably hear it. How you filter it makes a difference, right? So we've got the mouth. And then we've got the ears. But there's another couple of organs that are senses for us, and that's our eyes. And I wanted to talk to you about our eyes this morning. But I want to talk to you not just about what, what you physically see, but what you see with the eyes of your mind. I want to talk to you about perception, right? This, 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 here's the thing that's really important to us. We have perceptions of people, right? Now, my wife and I, we go through, uh, we, we, when we get in the car and we're driving somewhere, let's just say we, we, when we lived in Brisbane, we used to drive up the coast to go on holidays or do, do something, take a, a weekend up at the, a unit somewhere. And uh, as we're driving along, we see another car go past, right? We go, ah, oh, those people are obviously going to the beach because maybe we saw a beach ball in the back of the car, right? Oh, those people, uh, you know, they're obviously such and such. We would we, we make judgments on people based on what we saw in the car and what they were doing. And then it kind of became a bit of a game. And, you know, Felicity would say something like, uh, those people are going to um, the beach. And I say, no, those people stole a beach ball. <laughs> He's like, no, don't be stupid. I go, well, or someone put the beach ball in and didn't tell them. Or, you know, and, and we would just make up stories, right? Like, because the truth is, we don't actually know. <laughs> they could be going on holidays. They could be, they could be an accident. They could, the kid bought the beach ball and he was told not to. And they were going to the grandma. You know, I, I don't know. The point is, our perception, we think we're right, right? Was it was easy. We can tell because we can see what's going on there. But actually, we don't actually know. And it's kind of a little game. So this is this idea of perception. And, um, you know, it's... it's um, it's actually something that happens to all of us. It happens in everyday life, and it happens in our relationships. Because what we do is we actually we perceive what's happening around us. We, we look at people and something that happened. We hear the things they said. We look at the way they acted, and we say, oh, that's obviously what's going on there, right? But actually, our perception of events, and, and I don't know if you've ever been there too, where you you, uh, you go as a, a family, my wife and I will go somewhere, we'll, we'll be in a particular setting, we'll go home and, and on the way home in the car we'll talk about it and go, wasn't it great how so-and-so said such and such? And she'll say, they didn't say that, they said this. And you're like, wait, I'm sure they said that. No, no, they said, I, I don't know, like now I don't even know wh wh whether I was there or not, you know, I, because, my because my perception was different. And suddenly, you'd, suddenly you go, well, well, whose perception was right? Turns out it was always mine. Anyway, <laughs> actually, sorry, I lie. <laughs> uh, it, it, in the end, I go, uh, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, 
it's hard, isn't it? There's a story in the scripture that helps us with this, this idea of perception, and it's the story about Hannah. And it's, in, it, it's recorded about the, in Samuel. It's in 1 Samuel. And it's, you know, Hannah is, is the one who's, uh, uh, who, who gave birth to Samuel, right? And she's, she's in a bit of stress because she can't have a child. And each year they go up to Shiloh to, uh, to sacrifice, to be at the temple. And um, this, this, is, this is the story. I'll, I'll, I'll read it here from the scriptures to help us get the picture. I've kind of um, reduced the scripture down a little bit, so it's just I've just taken out the, the bits that uh, tell the story, right? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. So Eli's the priest. She is deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give, me your, give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she, observed, she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah, moved, uh, Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Sounds like he was a Wesleyan minister or something like that. I don't know. (laughs) Anyway. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord. I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. You know, then Eli answered, go in peace, you know. And the God of Israel grants a petition you have made to him. It was the best thing he said that day. And she said, and, and she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. It comes into focus now, doesn't it? Here's Eli. He's the priest of God, for goodness sake. Right? He's supposed to have some line to God, right? A direct one. Like God speaks to him. It's Eli. It's it's the way it happens, right? But turns out he has a perception problem. He's used his eyes in the wrong way. He's observed an event and he's made a judgment. That woman is drunk. She should put her wine away from you. And I just want to pause before you punish Eli on this, right? We should stop and dwell on our own lives just a little bit. Is it possible sometime in your life that you've ever observed somebody or something near or far from you where you make a judgment and you say, that's what's going on there, Look at that person. Look at the way they're behaving. They don't understand what life is like. They don't know what it really is. Obviously, they're drunk. Obviously, they don't know how to raise children. Obviously, they don't read their Bible. Obviously, they don't go to church enough. Obviously, they've got problems. I can see it from here. I've done that. And I've been wrong. Sometimes we're very easy on ourselves, right? And we're very hard on everybody else. (sighs) Clearly, I know what's going on. And clearly they don't, right? Because we're using the perception of our mind. Now, here's the thing I've learned. You can't trust it. It doesn't know the facts. But you have an idea. You think how someone behaved. You have an idea of their motives and their actions. But actually, you can't trust that because this perception is somehow skewed by something that's going on inside of you. More often than not, I'd say if you want to produce something reliable on how you can judge somebody else, it probably isn't through some kind of perception in your mind, right? Unless you have the gift of discernment, which is a specific gift from the Holy Spirit, I think sometimes we just don't know. And yet... Our world is filled with this kind of problem, constantly going on all the time. You vote liberal. You must have no idea. You vote liberal. You're green. You're, you believe in this. You follow that. I can't believe what you... Obviously, you guys have no idea what's going on. Judgment, right? Judgment. The thing is, you think you know someone's motives, and you think you have all the answers, 
I've, so, I've learned something when you're, when you're in education like myself and you, you ha, you, you're constantly having to learn and you're constantly having to teach. Um, Einstein had this little theory and it was, he said this, as the circle of light increases, so does the circumference of darkness around it. The more you know, the more you realize you have absolutely no idea, right? And, and this is the truth about life. I think it's time for us to stop thinking that we know so much and they don't. It's time for us to think about what Jesus was saying in the sense to, 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 to stop and to validate people, to, to stop and to, how would you know this person was stuck in their, bleeding in their life for 12 years unless you stopped and you had a chat with them, right? How would you know? Who are they? They're just the crowd. What do they know? It reminds me of a story. I don't know. Remember where I heard it. Uh, it was er- very impactful for me. And uh, you know, it, it was a story of a guy on a, on a train headed away from work at peak hour, like he's going home. Now, the story is about them, everyone on the train reading newspapers, so you know it's an old story, right? <laughs> I mean, they're all reading newspapers now, but they're not those... I mean, it was a very big art to actually fold the newspaper while not opening your elbows because you're sitting with people. I, I mean, I used to do it. You could flip it around, it was, it's amazing. But now you have this little pad and people are on the train but not really on the train, so it's not a new thing. Anyway, here they were on the train, and this dad was there and his two little kids. And the two little kids, they were running amok through the train, right? And it's peak hour and there's business people on the train and they're going home and they've had a hard day's work and these kids are like little rats, right? You know, they're jumping up and down, they're swinging off the, you know, the handles, they're, they're causing a, a lot of stress and everybody in the, on the train is stressed. And everyone is going like, oh my gosh, like they're thinking it. I wish that dad would just do something with those kids because it's annoying everybody on the train and everybody knows it. And finally, one one person, he puts the paper down and he goes, listen, mate, can you do something about those kids? Because they're just disrupting the whole train. And you could almost hear the little sigh of, finally, somebody said something. Thank goodness. Now at least he knows how terrible these children are. And then what happens is, the man goes, oh, he says, oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. He said, uh, I've just come from my wife's funeral and I had, and I just had, I, I just wasn't paying attention. I'm really sorry. I'll, I'll take care of the kids now. And everybody suddenly goes, it's, it's okay. Don't worry. Let the kids run. Let them run amok. What's the difference? The difference is you had a perception before. The perception is this guy doesn't know how to raise his children. He's paying no attention to what's going on. But actually your perception was wrong. What was happening, he was in grief. Right? He was suffering. And in that suffering, internalized it and forgot some of the other responsibilities he may have had. And when you know that truth, you change the way you think about something else. The problem here is truth. And many times what we do is we see something, but we don't understand the truth. We judge people, but we don't know the truth. We don't know the pain they're going through. We don't know the suffering they're going through. We don't know actually how they form those things. We don't know their motivations. And what Jesus tells us is we should love people. He doesn't say, wait till their motivations are right. Make sure that they agree with you about everything you think. Make sure that they, you, you make a judgment whether they cannot. He says, no, you should love them because they are my children love them you know it's a it's a hard one isn't it but we live with these perceptions and it's it's sobering to think that the only difference here is the truth or at least asking what the truth is and we always take that thing you know but look it's not just a a new story it's a it's a sorry it's not just an old story it's a new story here up on the screen i put a couple of years ago there was a facebook post i hope it turns up here on the screen Right, uh, a disabled parking sticker and a person parked there and didn't have a wheelchair, right? Now, you've seen it. Someone parks there, you look, A, a you look, you, I mean, I've done it. I look for the disabled sticker, right? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> All right, fine. I'm the only one. <laughs> it was me who wrote that. That's not my writing. But it looks like someone I know. No, I'm kidding. Here's that. Did you forget your wheelchair? And here's, here's, here's the response. It was on Facebook. It's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> to the person that left this on my car last week at the Mitchum Shopping Center, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was 35. Not just MS, but the worst one that never goes away 
and is slowly crippling my life. My kids have had to deal with things that kids shouldn't ever have to deal with. And all of your futures, our futures, are forever changed. On the day you saw me, I was having a good day. I was walking with my daughter, unaided, having a nice day. Thank you for ruining that. You made me feel like people were looking at me. The exact way I feel when I can't walk properly. I'm sick of people like yourself abusing me on my good days for using a facility I'm entitled to. A disability doesn't always mean a person has to be in a wheelchair, uh, has to be wheelchair bound. But lucky for you, I one day will be. Right now, my focus is to walk into my best friend's wedding next September and not have to be pushed. I'll be 42. Before you ruin another person's day, just remember you don't know everything. And just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean a person isn't struggling to put one foot in front of the other. J.M. Barry said these words, be kinder than you have to because you don't know what someone else is going through. Uh, I think we heard at the relationship seminars, take the, take the positive, t take the most positive uh, uh, approach for that particular thing that was said and done. Before you judge a person, <laughs> you know, and, and sorry, before you judge the person who wrote the note, we do this often. We just, maybe we don't write the note, but we do it often. See that person there, look what's going on there, look at the way that happened. But the problem is this wrong, wrong perception actually ruins relationships. And if we were truthful to say, we'd say there are some relationships in our life that have been ruined by people's perceptions, both of us, and there are relationships we've ruined by our perception of, of others. I'm sure you could relate countless times when you've been misunderstood or your motives have been questioned. The truth is this even happens in the church. Sadly, it happens in the church. And people fall out of relationship based on a perception. Right? They leave churches based on a perception. They leave the faith based on a perception. And they don't try to get the facts. And it's not just those that misunderstood. You know, it's not, not just about being misunderstood. Some people leave the church just by a perception of an event. In Eli's case, he made a judgment about what was happening with Hannah, but this was completely wrong. Imagine if he never found out. He would have gone through his whole life thinking, every year that woman comes to the temple and she is drunk. What kind of a person is? What kind of a husband does she have? If she's going to drink, she should at least not do it at church. Imagine if Hannah hadn't spoken up. She would have left the temple thinking, all I was trying to do was get closer to God and the priest abused me. I want nothing to do with the church. You know, if this had happened, we would never have heard of Samuel. We would never have met King David. Hannah would have gone home more bitter than ever. Bitter at the priest, bitter at God, and bitter at the church. And Eli would have gone along his pious ways with his judgmental attitude, never understanding what really happened. Eli thinking he was so righteous and so important that his position was important and yet so wrong. And this is the hard question for us. What if that's you? What if that's you? What if you've set your whole life on a certain course just because you viewed something a certain way? What if you set someone else's life on course just because you wrote them off? It's a hard word, isn't it, right? I'd like to say this scenario never happens in the church, but it does never happens in our relationships at home, but it does, perhaps sometimes even more so. I'd like to say that because we're supposed to love each other, right? And God has given us the tools about how to show love and how to offer forgiveness, right? But then I'd like to say that this rarely happens in the church, but it's not true. Every day it seems that we make judgments of each other. We perceive things and often we misunderstand. Every day people are hurt by these things and they leave the church or they carry the pain with them or they sit at the other side of the auditorium so they don't have to see you or be with you. They carry this pain with them. I've certainly experienced this in life. And I've been on both sides of this equation. 
I've made judgments about people's actions and reactions, and I have been wrong. Wrong. And I have eat, had to eat humble pie, and I have to say, I am sorry. But the truth be known, <laughs> I've had the same thing happen to me. I have people that perceive some things that I've done. I've had people in the church who said, you've treated me this way. You think this about me. I, I was cornered one day in the church um, when one man who used to come in and do uh, the lawns and, and different things like that, he, he, and it was just me and him on like a Saturday afternoon, and uh, I was doing my sermon. I came out to talk with him, and he, he stopped in the, in the foyer, and he said, oh, I've seen what you do to me. And I was like, uh, what? He says, I've seen the way you look at me like with derision and scorn and and he just went on like that. and i was just like i like i just i i don't i said i i, have to, I this is going to sound terrible but i have absolutely no idea what you're talking about can you give me some examples and he went through ideas and things about it. I, I no i said to him, look in the end we had a long conversation i said but what you have to realize this is i literally do not even know this this is not even in my heart. I've never thought of this, ever. Not even once. I didn't lie in my bed. I didn't think of these things. But he had been living his life, his whole time there, thinking that I actually had derision and scorn of him when I did not. I've had a pastor leave my church. He and his wife left my church because of something they perceived that I did, which I did not do. And I could not fix it because I could not talk to them. Because when I saw them in a particular context, they would turn away and walk away. If I was walking down the street and they were there, they would turn from me and walk away because they had a perception that I was this evil person who hated them. It's just not true. It's not true now. It wasn't true then. If they rang me for coffee, I'd meet them today. But that's a perception. And they've made decisions in their life about how they will live their life based on that thing, which is just not true. And here's the part. I call this alternate reality. Like it's a reality. It's real for you. And you order your life around these things because of what you've seen, because of what you perceive you've seen, and you make decisions. I won't go to that shopping center because I might run into them. I won't do this because I might see them. I will change the way that your that whole thing. I've been attacked by emails and and uh, you know and, uh, and 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 kind of like church litigation, if you like. And, and truthfully, I mean, it, it sounds funny, but it's true. Like prosecuted through the church to try and get a point across, which isn't even based on anything to do with who I am a and and there's no desire to actually find out this motivation see the, the presumption is I know your motivations I know what you were doing I know what you were thinking but they don't now this sermon's not about me but I'm just telling a story to tell you how it works you know that this is not necessary that they're living in this alternate reality I've heard some people say this to me, Christian leaders in the church who've said to me, I won't be in the same room as them. I'm going, wait, am I reading the, are we reading the same Bible? Because in the Bible it says, Jesus says, you can love your enemies. And those that spitefully use you, it, I don't know, I, I mean, maybe I'm strange, but that Bible is, is how I want to order my life. Those words of Jesus tell me something about how it ought to be. It's time to bring it home. There are two things to say about perception. One is that sometimes we think we know what's going on with someone else and we judge them, and while not always hurting them, it does hurt relationships. And the other is that sometimes we judge another person and we take on the hurt personally and we let it affect our lives. And the point that we make decisions about it based on our, uh, our perception. A uh, question for you is, you know, this is not me, I don't know this, but let me ask you a question. If you ever went to a supermarket and you saw that person in the aisle, would you change aisles? Would you turn away? This might be a clue. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> people do all sorts of things based on what they believe. Sadly, they'll drive down a street and run people over because of what they believe, innocent people. Belief drives us, belief's a weird thing. Inside a belief, there's one little word that stands out to me, be lie eat. Sometimes we believe a lie and that belief motivates us and it pushes us and it changes us. And I'm asking you to get that lie and deal with it in truth. 
find out what's really going on. As hard as it is, it's hard as it is. Sometimes you've got to get together with somebody. And, and there was a, a guy years ago who used to talk about a thing called tunnel talk, right? You'd start in the light on this side and you go down a deep, dark tunnel dealing with an issue and then come to the light on the other side. Sometimes you've got to do this. Is there anything in your life, in your life like this? Act personal. But I just want to add something here because I think this is the flavour of today. Sometimes our perceptions are not personal, they're public. And by that I mean is we look at the external world and we look at the world and people and what they do and we make judgments on them and we make judgments about who they are and the decisions they make and how stupid they are. I, I remember, um, you know, when the elections, uh, when, uh, when Scott Morrison was elected and I'm not speaking anything politically here about which party to vote for, nothing like that, just a story. You know, Scott Morrison was elected and a whole bunch of people said, I'm leaving the stupid people in Australia and I'm going to New Zealand. Can't believe how stupid people are, right? You know, it's like, well, wait on, wait on, wait on. Here's the thing about this. Like, I'm not saying who you vote for or whatever. I'm just saying, but wait, you're saying we belong to a democracy. People make decisions. But if they don't make your decision, they're stupid. Think about this, right? Forget politics. Think about Facebook. People don't say something you like. How stupid are those people? Those vaccine sheep. Sorry. Those sheeple. Just follow everyone. Look at them. I judge them. I judge their motivations. I judge their attitudes. I know what's going on there. Those people haven't got any common sense. They don't know the facts. Maybe the person doesn't know the facts is you. I'm feeling this is probably a bit touchy, right? I just want you to know I wrote this sermon in 2016. <laughs> I did. It's true. No COVID. But this is what we do. We judge people, right? Their attitudes, their way, this is going on. Those politicians, they mean this. That's happening over there. This conspiracy thing. We see it. We read it on Facebook. We forget that there might be some facts that we're missing, right? How about this? Those churches that sing those Bethel songs... Ooh, we should camp around here a bit. <laughs> what are we doing? Do we know their motives? Do we know their heart? Do you know whether they love Jesus or not? I guarantee you this, you don't have any idea. And I, I bet you none of you went and asked. So I'm just saying this, it's time for us to stop that. Stop that. We're the kingdom of God, for goodness sake. We're Christians, for goodness sake. We're supposed to love people, for goodness sake. This is not about us trying to make everybody like us. This is a terrible error in the church where we think, you've got to be like me to be a proper Christian. It's the thing that destroys us. No, 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 no. You have to love Jesus to be a Christian. That's it, right? And the problem is that in that way, some people believe us a little bit that way, and some people do a little bit that way. And I'm just saying to you, stop it. Love people because they're people. Love them because they need to be loved. Don't hate them because they don't follow your ways. They should just be loved. Jesus said about the man on the way to Jericho, beaten by people, left alone. The Samaritan took care of him. Here's what he told us about that man. Nothing. <laughs> he didn't tell us he was gay. He didn't tell us he was rich. He didn't tell us he had the COVID jab. He didn't tell us he didn't. You know what he told us? He said, if anybody's in trouble and they can't help themselves, then you should love them. That's what he told us. Your perception shouldn't be, I'm not touching them. He deserved that. He went the wrong way. He did the wrong thing. He was the wrong kind of person. Too bad for him. That's not the way Jesus works. He says, love the person who cannot help themselves and show compassion, even if it costs you, even if it hurts. The question for today is this, do any of us have these perceptions? Do any of us need to stop acting in an alternate reality to the truth? Do any of us need to think about, it shouldn't be questions, we need to think about our biases and our attitudes. I know I do. Because relationships actually are affected by this. And it's not just, you know, perceptions, as I said, it's not just perceptions of people you see, but we can see through the keyboard and through the, the computer as well, right? We need more Christians who don't settle for a distant view of the situation, but who who try to understand what happened and live the truth of that. It's one of the most hard, one of the, likely one of the hardest things you'll ever do. 
But if we can get this, our relationships will be so much sweeter. Because it won't be about whether you're in, you know, we, we can actually love people who aren't like us, who don't think like us. Imagine a world, this is hard I know because Christians have struggles with this, imagine a world which has different people with different ideas. Imagine that world. Imagine where we can, we can love people, even if they did have different ideas. It's hard, isn't it? It's time for us to finish. I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for me. You know, I always think a preacher, it, you know, the word must get to the preacher first, right? This is a real thing for us. It's really destructive in our relationships, and it's really destructive in the church. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray for that person here today who knows the person that has upset them, that they've got a perception about, about how they were treated, about what happened. And I want, just as we pause right now, if that name comes to your mind, I want you to offer them to Jesus. And I want you to say, Jesus... That's, that's been controlling my life. I've been making decisions about what I do and what I don't do based on that. I want you to take it. God, I pray that you would take that, the pain and the perception and that you would bring healing. And if there's opportunity, may the truth be able to be sought. If there's opportunity, may it be able to be resolved. But if not, God, I pray that you would help us to just take a different attitude to... to to realize that actually only you, you're working with us and that you help us. God, I pray for those of us who um, perhaps have made judgments on others. Clearly, they just don't get it. Whether those judgments are theological, whether they're stylistic, whether they're um, philosophical, whether they're religious, whether they're ideological. Help us to recognize you love unconditionally. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, and you ask us in the, the, great, um, uh, the great opportunity we have to just pass it on to others. God, I pray that the mercy we receive will be mercy we give. That the forgiveness we receive will be forgiveness we give. That the love we receive will be love we give. That we would known, be known, as the scripture tells us, as those who love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our service today. We would love to invite you to head over to our website, accesschurch.org.au, where there's a connect form that you can fill out to get in contact with one of our team here. Or you can also give if you call Access Church your home and would like to partner with us financially. And there's also, you can fill out a prayer request if you have something on your heart that you'd like us to be praying for you for. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed day.